Hello, and thank you for joining us for this CAPTURE-GEL webinar, entitled Enhancing Solubility Using Lipid-Based Formulation Technology. Today, CAPTURE-GEL Dosage Form Solution team will discuss lipid-based formulation technologies. My name is Hassan Benamer, and I am the Senior Director of Pharmaceutical Sciences at CAPTURE-GEL's Product Development Center in Strasbourg. I will be presenting today along with my colleagues, Dr. Edouard Dujoux, Senior Manager for Formulation and Development at Cartridge Product Development Center in Cambridge, USA, and Dr. Jan Vertomen, Director of Development Center Pharma, also based in Strasbourg, France, with me. Over the next 45 minutes, we will discuss the factors to consider when choosing a solubility enhancement technology the variety of lipid-based formulation possibilities, and the key challenges. My colleagues will provide case studies to demonstrate these technologies, range of application, and resultant bioavailability improvement achieved. We will then have about 15 minutes to take any question from you. When you have a question, please submit them at any time using the Ask a Question tab on the left of the screen. Feel free to use the tab at any time. We will answer your questions at the end. And if we don't get to your question, we will follow up directly. We also have plus three poll questions throughout the webinar and welcome your input. Such two-way information sharing is one of the reasons Capsule hosts these webinars. It is our goal that you find these events opportunity to learn about our technologies and for us to learn about your needs in bioavailability enhancement. Finally, at the end of the seminar, we will also have a brief survey. We look forward to your comments and feedback. We thank you in advance for your participation. Now, let's begin. First, I want to share a brief overview of Capsigel and our dosage form solution business. Capsigel is a global leader in providing innovative, high-quality dosage forms and solutions for the healthcare industry. We are known as leaders in capsule design and innovation. Our company employs about 3,000 people and has 12 manufacturing sites and R&D facilities across three continents. The company recently formed his dosage form solution, or DFS business unit, to integrate its specialized technology platforms, R&D capabilities, and manufacturing infrastructure. Our integrated business model takes a product concept throughout formulation, clinical, to scale up, and commercial manufacturing of innovative dosage forms. We have expanded our technology platforms and manufacturing capabilities by acquisition. NCAP drug delivery was acquired in March of this year, and we recently announced the acquisition of Bench Research, which is expected to close this month. The three focus area for dosage form solution include bioavailability enhancement, modified and targeted release, specialized healthcare application, including liquid semi-solid field solutions. With the acquisition of Bench, we will have a premier range of bioavailability enhancing technology and the full range of modified release capabilities. Indeed, the bioavailability enhancements still a challenge nowadays. As seen on the graph, the class two compounds in development pipeline represent 70%. There are a number of strategies to improve bioavailability, and typically a stepwise process is pursued. Often the time evaluate a number of approaches in parallel. To be effective and efficient, knowledge and capability across multiple approaches is critical. Speed to clinic is enhanced, where trial and error is minimized throughout the application of modeling and expert systems. Finished dose of manufacturing will also be considered. Today, we will discuss lipid-based drug delivery system development using our unique rational and systematic approach. Case studies will be presented for these approaches using in both preclinical and clinical evaluation. 
As you should see on the screen, it is time for our first polling question. I read the question and the answers and will give you a few seconds to respond. We really appreciate your feedback. The first question is, what is your lead approach toward improving solubility enhancement? Particle size reduction, solid dispersions, lipid-based formulation, other? Thank you for your answers. The first step of any technology assessment is the qualification of the direct candidate for the technology. In the particular case of lipid-based formulation, we can regroup two aspects. In blue shown on the screen, the physical factor and the biological factor shown in orange. This is uniqueness of the lipid base is that we can tackle the both approach with one technology. Indeed, as you can see on the slide, is that the lipid base formulation are first physiologically well tolerated and absorbed and can deal with solubility and to extent permeability by increasing solubilization and drug disposition in the, in the intestine increasing enterocyte by transport and metabolic process, and affecting absorption pathway of drug transport to systemic circulation. This made the lipid-based formulation unique. This has been proven on commercial formulation using that lipid liquid field technology. And as you can see from the slide, there are several market products representing four class of lipid-based formulation from type 1, 100% lipid, to type 4 with the absence of lipid. But we'll be gathering more in detail these terminologies. But why do we not have more lipid-based drug delivery system on the market? Because there are some unmet challenges answer. First is the lack of scientific rationale for excipient selection, the need for clarity defined type of lipid-based system, third, the lack of consensus and appropriate in vitro test methods, and fourth, the dependence of in vivo studies for screen and selection. We'll be going stepwise toward these four challenges for lipid-based systems. In the case of the excipient selection, what is key is that those excipients are mixture and we mix them to the formulation strategy. This is then giving a specific phase composition, and it's important to, to draw on those phase diagrams to have an understanding of those formulations. Let's go to that diagram that you see on the screen, which is an hypothetic diagram of a colloidal phase formed in the in vitro or in the gastrointestinal tract. If I'm taking a formulation consisting of oil and a blend of surfactants, we do assume that those surfactants are first miscible. Formulation 1 is a composition rich of lipid, and if you do a dissolution of that formula, we have a coarse emulsion. That's why these formulations are called SETS, which means self-emissifying drug delivery system. Keeping the same excipient and changing the ratio to formulation 2, this formulation upon dissolution will make a water in all microemulsion. That's why they called a SMET, self-emissifying drug delivery system. The third formula is a rich system with a factor with a low oil concentration. This will generate missiles and is more known as a type 4 formulation. But what you see mostly is those formulations within a phase diagram, 
you will have different phase uh, mixture that can have a transition that can lead to the precipitation of your API and give variability in in vivo performance. If I'm taking the formulation 2, you see that we are moving from a big continuous microemulsion system upon dilution to a microemulsion area and starting from an L2 phase. All those phase tra transition can be dramatic for your performance. To select and to avoid this try and error approach in the uh, formulation design, Capture has developed a rational approach for selecting the correct excipient ratio to optimize this dispersion. I will show you this through the example as you can see on the screen, formulation F1 and F2, two liquid formula in which API is solubilized. The question we can have is which one to select for the next step and for in vivo evaluation. We do first a dispersion in water of this formulation and you can see that formulation 1 give you an emulsion, a coarse emulsion with a 70, 375 nanometer dispersion and formulation 2 give you a microemulsion. So the best formula to select after this dispersion test is the formulation 2. The way to enhance that approach of formulation selection criteria is that we did, instead of having a try and error approach or we doing all the time the ternary diagram, we have developed an in silico formulation design using the lipid expert system. This system, as you can see on the uh, print screen, is a collection of data based on solubility performance of the API in the selected excipient. In the example shown, you see that we have been using a 50 milligram dose and we had a solubility in 12 selected excipients ranging from 2 to 25 millig uh, milligram per gram. The next step then in the formulation system, the lipid expert system, is that he will be able to help you to select, as I shown you through the illustration, the best single phase formulation upon dilution or dispersion as shown in the right corner in blue highlighted. You see that from the start up to 90% dissolution, you have a single phase without phase transition. This is exactly what we are looking for, and this system provides you a rational, or in another word, a quality by design approach, giving you the exact rational selection of that formula. Now it is time for the second polling question. How often have you used lipid-based formulation in the past? 1 to 5, 6 to 10, more than 10, never. Please answer the question. Thank you for your answer. If we continue to illustrate better from a visual aspect what we try to do using our lipid expert system is that instead of having a try and error approach, we have immediately selected the best microemulsion dispersion of the lipid based system, avoiding phase separation and or drug precipitation. As illustrated here from the end left, an immiscible system up to a coarse emulsion. In between, you have the right approach, which is a microemulsion system. So, with this example, we have shown you that 
We have developed an extensive excipient database compiling over 10 years of experience and real data. This is not a computational approach, but real database. We have also developed this, thanks to the Lipid Expert system, a possibility to initiate formulation selection based only on solubility screening. So this rationale for excipient selection has been tackled, as I have been able to demonstrate to you. Now, the question is, when we are talking about lipid-based system, this will mean different approach for different person. For example, a person coming from the liposome world, a liposome is a lipid formulation. And for somebody developing a suspension in an oil, this is also a lipid-based formulation. So there is a different broad range in the qualification or definition of the lipid-based formulation. So let's tackle now that challenge from the uh, proposal made uh, at Capsugel. So to answer that understanding of lipid-based formulation, Professor Powton has developed or defined a lipid formulation classification system. And by working in collaboration with Capsugel, we have refined it to an extent that is presented now, and it has been published in 2006. Indeed, what you can see is that now we have a clear definition of the lipid formulation system from a type 1, consisting of 100% oil, to a type 4, which is a free oil system. In between, you have the combination between rich surfactants or low surfactant composition. This is now widely accepted in the communi community. But what was key is instead of talking about formulation composition, we have been able to work on the performance criteria. Indeed, as you can see, we have two criteria, two performance criteria exactly. One physical, which is the dispersion, and one biological, which is the digestion. And only by assessing these two performance criteria, we can quickly define the type of formulation and be able to have more clarity on the understanding of the performance. But the next challenge is how, which method in vitro could we use to select those formulations before the clinical trials. So as we, as, as we have seen, we have been able to answer the clarity of the lipid-based system by the uh, lipid formulation classification system and by providing an effective and consistent mean to describe those lipid-based formulations. The next challenge is the lack of consensus and appropriate in vitro test method. To answer the lack of consensus in in vitro test for lipid-based formulation system, Capsugel has established, with the support of academia and other industry, a lipid formulation classification system consortium. As you can see on the slide, this is a non-profit organization that have the objective to advance science of lipid-based system by defining universal SOPs to establish performance criteria and in vitro in vivo correlation. We are in the third year of the LFCS consortium and we have eight industrial partners, including Sanofi, Actelion, BMS. Recently, in 2011, the FDA acknowledged that approach, which is a good work between academia and industry. If you want to learn more about the LFCS consortium, please visit the website.
The outcome of the work done in the last three years is illustrated here in which we have an individual digestion test to add the formulation selection. Indeed, as you can see, in the left hand, the digestion testing is now harmonized thanks to the LFS consortium, and we can test now type 1, type 2, type 3, type 4 lipid formulation with the same SOP as demonstrated from the work done at Monash and Copenhagen University. So we have a better key performance criteria that help us to discriminate between formulation and identify lead formulation before clinical testing. Once we have tackled the physical factor of lipid formulation, we still have the second approach, which are the biological factor. In that approach, it's important also to know the effect of excipients on, for this example, the transporters. And we did map, as illustrated here, the difference performance between each excipient for the BCRP inhibition or the PGP inhibition. And you can see that some excipient can be BCRP specific and other PGP specific, and some are, are specific. They inhibit both the BCRP and PGP. And this has been published, and I'm interested to have more information for the work done in collaboration of Professor Sugiyama from Tokyo's university. Please refer to the um, reference we have. It's important to say that this has been also assessed in animal, and we have been showing no significant change in the intracellular ATP level. So there's no real modification using that. It's a reversible. So as I show you, thanks to the approach that has been taken, we have been able to establish a guideline for in vitro testing of lipid-based system throughout the LFCS consortium. And we have a greater clarity in the factor that determine the lipid-based system performance. The last challenge that still and was identified is the dependence upon in vivo study for screening and selection of the lipid-based formulation. In that regard, thanks to the appropriate in vitro test, the digestion, and the way to identify the best performing formulation, as you can see on the slide, if you develop four formulation and we run them, and just to let you know that these four formulation, we couldn't discriminate them in dispersion, so with the physical factor, but we could now through the digestion. And you see that formulation one perform the best in vitro. So the question was, which formulation will be able to perform better in vivo? As you can see from your left hand, the pharmacokinetic data for on dogs, that the formulation one behaved the best, and the formulation four was the worst. So we have been able to have a kind of ranked screening confirming the in vitro test. So we have been able to select now the best formulation for preclinical, but also to go for clinical testing. So by this example, we have now a better understanding of the factor that affect performance plus new tools in formulation design and testing enabling best formulation to be identified in vitro and be selected for the in vivo and clinical study. It is, down, it is, it is now time for third question. 
how many active drug development projects requiring solubility enhancement does your company have ongoing? None, one to five, more than five. Thank you for your answers. We have now go, uh, been to the journey of a lipid-based formulation development. And on this slide, I'm making you the summary and the overall picture. So we start from the selection of the excipient. Then you have the, the dispersion or the dispersibility assessment in the stomach. And then we move down to the intestine in which we have the digestion. And then we have the absorption effect, passive or mediated, and if needed, to stop this biological factor through excipient selection. So our development step is toward the behavior of the lipid bait formulation in the gastrointestinal tract and lead to a key detailed pharmacocytical understanding that is important for the clinic study. So the summary of what has been done, it is key for successful development of lipid-based system to select the right drug candidate, high low P or low melting, and a good permeability. Selection of the right excipient based on physical factor, the solvent capacity, the phase behavior on the solution, and select the right excipient based on the biological factor which is digestibility, impact on efflux transporter, impact of intestinal pre metabolism, or recruitment of the lymphatic system. After more than 10 years of research, we now have acquired the understanding and developed the tool to optimize lipid-based system before preclinical and clinical evaluation. Now, I will have my colleague, Dr. Eduardo Jun, from our product development center in Cambridge, share the first case study demonstrating the physical and biological consideration le leading to a lipid-based formulation approach to a preclinical evaluation. Thanks for the introduction, Hassan. Let me share with you a recent experience out of our product development center in Cambridge, Mass, working with Ironwood Pharmaceuticals and local biotech. The client is currently developing a small molecule, and phase one findings indicate efficacy superior to that of existing drugs in the therapeutic area with reduced side effects. The compound, however, displays poor water solubility, is subject to substantial food effects, for which a wide initial dose range was defined as 15 to 300 milligrams. In addition, the compound is known to be subject to PGP-mediated efflux and pre-systemic metabolism, making lipids extremely attractive over other platforms. An aqueous suspension provides significant increase in bioavailability, but does not alleviate foot effects. And the ongoing nature of preclinical studies required rapid formulation development and testing. The very first step prior to commencing any work was qualifying the drug candidate or making sure we had the right fit between the formulation challenge and the technology. This is done by compiling different sets of data, including physical and biological parameters. On the physical factors, we have the dose, which, as mentioned before, was defined between 15 and 300 milligrams, the structure, which was available and enabled tailored excipient selection, the molecular weight, the solubility in water and other excipients, as well as the log P. On the biological front, the permeability is known and known to be high. As mentioned before as well, the compound is subject to efflux and pre-systemic metabolism, for which excipients known to inhibit these parameters were selected from the get-go. 
exposure is known to be increased by an aqueous suspension. And also, the compound is known to be subject to foot effects. Overall, we were able to conclude the compound is a good candidate for lipid-based formulation, for which we decided to go into a preformulation step. Preformulation, or feasibility, was evaluated through solubility screening in different excipient families, between glycerol, PEG, and propylene glycol derivatives of varying chain length and degrees of lipophilicity. A number of things were determined. First of all, the maximum dose at 30 to 40 milligrams per gram. Solubility trends, which also enables definition of formulation strategy. And between measurements of solubility and a month's worth of stability data, a GO decision was recommended after five weeks. Next, we move to a formulation step consisting of formulation development and testing. Based on the Lipidix rationale, Several dozen formulations, including single, binary, and ternary, were identified and were found to solubilize the compound at the target 30 mg per gram concentration in a stable manner. Next, we tested the formulations, or specifically their ability to retain the API in solution post-dispersion and post-digestion. All of this data was used to recommend three formulations that were moved into preclinical studies. At completion of this 10-week program, four formulations, including three lipid-based self emulsifying systems and one aqueous suspension, were dosed in fasted dose at 30 milligrams. First of all, all lipid-based formulations displayed significant increases in Cmax, in AUC, and in exposure, even over the aqueous suspension. Second, exposure itself was increased up to 65% versus the 35 percent achieved for aqueous suspensions. At 30 milligrams, AUC values were found to be higher than that of the API dosed in the capsule at a 10x dose or 300 milligrams. In conclusion, we can say that drug candidate qualification enables straightforward selection and testing of single excipients, including excipients known to block efflux and presystemic metabolism. High consumer engagement led to an accelerated GO decision at conclusion of preformulation. A well-established development approach enabled selection, screening of several dozen formulations, leading to recommendation of three lead compound formulations. Naquist suspension, previously dosed at 30 milligrams, increased PK values and exposure itself to 35% over powder and capsule dosed at 300 milligrams. However, all three lipid-based formulations provided significantly higher PK value increases over the suspension, enhancing exposure to over 60%. The program was conducted in 10 weeks from feasibility to capsule supplies for drug studies, all supported by stability data. Slide 34 lists a few articles for your further reference. Hassan, back to you. Thank you, Eduardo. Now I will have my colleague, Dr. Jan Vertomen, with our Product Development Center in Strasbourg, France, share a second case study demonstrating the physical and biological consideration leading to a type 4 lipid-free approach in a clinical evaluation. Jan, it's over you now. Hassan, uh, thank you very much for this uh, nice introduction. So for the second uh, case study, uh, we have selected an example uh, for a compound called uh, amuvatinib, which is a multi-targeted tyrosine kinase inhibitor, which is uh, actually under development by a company called uh, Aztex Pharmaceuticals, also known uh, formerly as uh, Supergen. And they investigate this compound uh, as a use in certain cancer indications. Initially, the company uh, administered the compound in early phase one cancer studies as a uh, dry powder formulation containing a sodium lauryl sulfate as a solubility enhancer. There was evidence of activity, but however, the systemic exposure 
was lower than expected and needed to continue the clinical trials. Therefore, Aztec Pharmaceuticals decided to investigate the development of an alternative formulation with the objective to increase the exposure. Aztec Pharmaceuticals and Capsigel uh, sat around the table and reviewed all available in vitro, in vivo, and clinical data and decided together to embark on a lipid-based formulation development. Just to have some insight, please find in slide 36 also some key compound characteristics of the compound as the hydrochloride salt of amiovatinib. It is a small chemical entity with a molecular weight and below 500 Daltons with limited aqueous solubility, both for the hydrochloride salt as for the free base. It's less than 3 to 5 microgram per milliliter. However, also the solubility in lipids is quite low, especially in view of the target dose of 30 milligram. The lipid solubility was extremely low, and that's why we decided to go for a suspension approach. Besides the physical chemical characteristics, also the biological characteristics are quite important, and one of the reasons why we have selected a lipid-based formulation approach. The apparent permeability was high, as noted on a KQ2 model, giving values of about 44, 10 minus 6 centimeter per second. So it is a poorly soluble but highly permeable compound, so BCS class 2 compound. However, there was some in vitro data indicating that amuvatinib is a substrate both for CYP3A4 and PGP. Moreover, there was also a positive food effect noted during some of their studies. If we move to uh, slide 37, uh, we can see that uh, the formulation we developed, as already discussed, was a suspension type lipid-based formulation, developed based on dispersion and digestion testing, as explained in great detail by Hassan and Eduardo. But as it is a suspension type formulation, we added some additional testing, and especially the sentimentation testing using a near infrared centrifugal stability analyzer was added to select the lead lipid based formulation. The lead lipid based formulation was an LFCS type 4 semi solid lipid based formulation which was composed of a tocopherol derivative and some lipidic surfactants. And it provided both increased apparent solubility in the gastrointestinal fluids, but as well it had the potential to influence certain of the biological factors which were quite important for this molecule. As the lipid-based formulation was a suspension type formulation, the development of the encapsulation process is key. To achieve a good encapsulation process, we used Capsugel's standard formulation characterization program, which is described in much more detail in reference 3. The references are available at the end of the study. And we use in this kind of uh, program both DSC or differential scanning calorimetry and rheological measurements to select the right filling temperature. And based on the results of this characterization, we decided that the filling temperature was set at 40 degrees for this particular formulation. We continued our quality by design approach also by doing a process simulation as shown on slide 38, the encapsulation process using our quality by design approach is shown for this particular semi-solid lipid-based formulation. So in blue on the graph, you can see the typical shear rates, which can be found during a typical encapsulation process. So a low shear in the feeding hopper, 
we have an increasing share once the formulation goes through the filling pumps with values up to 100 and dropping again once the formulation is filled into the capsule. As already indicated, the filling temperature was set at 40 degrees Celsius. So we have 40 degrees Celsius in the feeding hopper and in the filling pumps. And once the formulation is filled into the capsules, the temperature drops quickly as the capsules are cooled to a temperature of about 25 degrees. What is important during the process is to follow the viscosity value, which is typically low in the feeding hopper, which increases when the formulation goes through the filling pumps. So ideally, we have there a viscosity somewhere between 100 and 1,000, as it is the case for this particular formulation. This is important to avoid that formulation is spilled or that some of the formulation is on the segments of the filling machine contaminating the external parts of the capsules. Once the formulation is in the capsule and the formulation cools down and solidifies, then of course the viscosity goes up again towards the 10,000 millipascal per second, as you can see following the green line. The process described in this graph allowed us then to scale up and to successfully encapsulate this particular lipid-based formulation on industrial scale equipment. If we move to slide 39, we can see some of the clinical results obtained with this particular lipid-based formulation. In the graph, you can see the mean plasma concentrations of the compound administered as a dry powder formulation with the sodium and sulfate, or as a lipid-based suspension formulation. And what we can note from the graph is that the data really demonstrate a six-fold increase in Cmax and a two-fold increase in the area under the curve for the lipid-based formulation when we compare this formulation to a dereference tripowder formulation. So this gave the exposure as text pharmaceuticals needed to move on into the next clinical studies. If we then come to slide 40 to the conclusions, we can conclude that the encapsulated lipid-based type 4 suspension formulation that we developed together with Astex Pharmaceuticals improved the exposure for amuvatinib, but also gave similar safety profiles compared to a dry powder dust form. And this lipid-based dosage form allowed Astex Pharmaceuticals to continue their clinical studies in the cancer indications. So a second point we can learn from the study is that the quality by design, formulation characterization, and process development approach allows you to successfully manufacture large-scale clinical batches on industrial-scale equipment. And this, when in a short period of time, we managed to do all this work within six months from the start of the program up till the large-scale clinical manufacturing. I thank you for your attention, and I will pass the word again to the Hassan. In summary, we hope we have conveyed that the lipid-based formulation can address both physical and biological factor, and is often an optimal approach for improving solubility. Thought lipid-based formulation can appear complex. They are quite viable in the hands of an experienced scientist. Enabled by lipid-based formulation experience and a database of reference formulation, the lipid-based formulation challenge continues to be addressed to ensure that this premier approach to improve bioavailability is increasingly commercialized. The DFS fast-track program depicted here can speed an API candidate to clinic in less than 20 weeks. Aided by the Lipid Expert System, our experienced formulation team, and specialized large-scale filling and sealing equipment. Our integrated business model incorporates finished dosage forms, 
commercial manufacturing, also aided by specialized filling and sealing equipment. Thank you for your attention, and we are now ready to answer the question that you have submitted. I'm joined by Eduardo Jules for the Q&A. We have a number of questions, and we will not have time to answer all of them in the time remaining. We will, however, summarizing all the questions and our answer, this summary, along with the slides used today, will be forwarded to you separately. Now for the first question, how quickly can an assessment be made and so to whatever a lipid or liquid fill approach is feasible for a particular compound. Ed, can you take the answer for that question? Sure thing, Hassan. Um, once we've qualified the drug candidate or we've made sure, in other words, that we have the right fit between the formulation challenge and our technology, it takes us about five weeks, about a week to measure solubility, a month to generate some stability data, I'm sorry, to recommend a go-no-go -no -go decision or whether developing a lipid formulation at the target dose in a stable form is feasible. Uh, thank you, Ed, for your answer. Here's the second question. Does the PKA or ionic behavior of the compound play a role in the selection of the lipid-based formulation approach? Uh, the answer is yes. I think this is where we directly see that uh, lipid-based formulation will be suited more for based on an acidic compound, and that the ionic or salt part will have a certain adjustment to be made that is less suitable for a lipid-based formulation. So we usually recommend to use a neutral, a basic, or an acid compound. So I have another question here coming. Uh, how quickly can an assessment be made as to whatever lipid or field or liquid field, sorry, approach is feasible for a particular compound. Ed, can you take that? Sure thing, Hassan. Um, it's going to take us about five weeks to generate, to conduct a feasibility study and recommend a go-no-go. -go. Okay, thanks. Uh, if a molecule, there's another one. Uh, if a molecule has a low melting point, it will have a good solubility. So the question, what is the need for lipid-based formulation in that case? This is a, an approach in which with a low melting point, some of the API will have some uh, variability in the filling and difficulty. By melting it in a lipid formula, we have a better uh, fill weight and better delivery within the, the capsule. There are numerous of products commercial using this strategy, and the one that I have in mind is the vancomycin product. I have another one here. What do you mean by high log of P? What value should be at the starting point? I'll take that. Usually for uh, when we're talking about high log of P, we're talking of log of P starting at above 3, ideally uh, 4 to 5 which is, will lead to a high uh, lipid solubility. But as we have been demonstrating, is that in certain cases when the biological factors are more important than the uh, lipid solubility, then in fact we can develop a lipid-based formulation in a lipid suspension with a low log of P of around 2 to 3. Absolutely. That's one of the case studies we uh, we discussed today, Hassan. Uh, molecules, small molecule with a log P of 2 or 3, but where biological factors were really critical uh, was turned out to be a great candidate for lipid-based formulation. Thank you, Ed. So we have another uh, question before closing. What digestion media was used for the in vitro test? Ed, I'll let you answer that. So we typically use a digestion media that includes pancreatin uh, and bile salts to conduct digestion and simulate what actually happens in the small intestine. Thank you. So the last question for, the, uh, for today, I think the, uh, 
Does the lipid expert system allow for discriminating excipients for their biological factor or biopharmaceutical properties? So the answer is yes. This is, uh, has been uh, put in the system in two approach. So the approach of, as we presented, the uh, efflux and also on the uh, concept of the digestion throughout the selection of the formula. I think we still have time to uh, to take a question. The one related, or will the presentation be available and how? Yes, this presentation will be uh, uh, presented as a handout and uh, will be sent to people to make the request. And you can have that on the uh, capsule gel. email. So as mentioned, you have the slide that contact us. If you make that inquiry, we will be delighted to send you that. Oh, there's a lot. Um, really, it looks like uh, people say we can have uh, have more questions. There, just. Uh, I would see that thing. one question here: uh, whether lipid formulations require any type of special capsules. Lipid uh, formulations are typically um, filled and sealed or banded. We at Capsule Gel recommend utilizing Lee caps. These stand for liquid capsules which are a two-piece capsule with a different, very specific design to accommodate liquid, but also semi-solid fills. These capsules are subsequently sealed or fused, that is, the two layers, the body and the cap of the capsule, are sprayed with small amounts of water and a solvent to fuse the two layers together and move from a two-piece into a one-piece capsule. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Ed. I think we still have, maybe you can, uh, there was uh, somebody telling us here uh, that the, uh, didn't hear well what was the digestive media that we used. I think you can repeat that it is not a pre-made one or are these uh, plain buffer. Uh, and can you re 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 this sure also thing, giving so. the reference on the uh, LFTS? Absolutely. There's a couple of references that are available upon request. Some of the papers that the LFCS consortium has uh, come out with that summarize the what we expect to roll out later as universally acceptable methods to conduct initially digestion but also dispersion in vitro. So the what we try to do in terms of digestion is first of all predispersing the system and then um, adding enzymes and valve salts to trigger digestion. And what we're looking for are, as we mentioned during uh, case study one, are formulations that have the ability to retain the API in solution, the drug candidate in solution, post-dispersion, number one, but also post-digestion. So once we conduct that digestion of the formulations, <clears throat> which are obviously will depend, the extent of which will depend on the composition of the formula, we will um, isolate samples and um, separate the API retained in an aqueous environment as opposed to the to precipitating media or even undigested phases to determine again out of the initial amounts of API dispersed how much of it was able to benefit or not from that digestion. Uh, thank you, Ed. I think we have another, we can take uh, one or two other uh, question because we really have plenty and we thank you for that. Another question is, will a lipid formulation work if the drug has a low permeability also? So the answer is to say yes, if the low permeability is due to a biological factor, we explained, could be an efflux approach, PCRP or PGP, a subset that we know that they are excipient that inhibit those um, those transporters, and if it is the case of uh, a metabolism, a pre-systemic metabolism, we can also indeed stop that in the uh, uh, before uh, the systemic absorption of the compound. So it really depends how we define the permeability. 
if it is a, an apparent permeability per se, the answer is not. If the low permeability is due to, and this is well defined by uh, Professor uh, Leslie Bennett, if it, if it is based on the biological factor, then the answer is yes. Okay, I think uh, on behalf of Capsigel Desert Form Solution, thank you again for your time and interest. We hope that you have found this webinar informative. We will have ongoing webinars on bioavailability enhancement technology in the future and hope that you will join us again. Please fill out the brief survey which will help us improve future webinars. Also, this webinar and future webinars will be posted on our website for future viewing by you and all your colleagues. To reiterate, you will receive the webinar slide deck and a summary of the Q&A. Please contact us at bfsinquiry at topfusion.com with any inquiries or requests for follow-up regarding your solubility enhancement project, and we will be responding promptly. Thank you.